to hear. Um, this is your introduction to a professional artist talk. Um, I have this posted on your Google Classroom, so if you can't quite see it, um, I, I need you to review the instructions there as well as um, following the rubric uh, and the grading criteria. Um, I'll have a class sign up uh, next week, April 12th. Um, I've asked that this get actually turned in. Um, your presentation itself by the 26th on the Google Classroom. So it can be a slide, a Google slide lecture, it can be a, a long, large PDF, it's really whatever you prefer. Um, but that's just for my records. Ultimately, you'll all be doing your talks on uh, over the course of two weeks, the 17th, the 19th, the 24th, and the 26th. I've asked that you spend about 12 to 15 minutes on that lecture. Please do not go over. Uh, I will actually have a timer so that we can fit everybody in. Um, and I am going to give you a demonstration about what that looks like now. Um, mine won't be 15 minutes because I'll be talking about two bodies of work, but we'll go through it fairly quickly. So uh, generally you want to start with a slide that sort of is uh, uh, punctuation, um, having your name, maybe your position, um, and a, an example of your work. So we'll start from here. Um, I was actually raised in a military family. My father was in the Navy. Um, it looked pretty conventional for the most part for the early part of my life. Um, we traveled a lot. In fact, we spent the first uh, five, almost six years of my life in Italy. But immediately upon return, we became really uh, an even more conventional family in that my mom was a single mom at that point, raising three kids on her own. Um, my earliest memories are on the Amalfi Coast in a place called Ga Gaeta, Italy where we were stationed, um, and it was incredibly magical. Um, my brother would take me out on a um, clear plastic bottomed boat. I was very, very small into this place that had um, these sort of famous Roman grottos. When I was six years old, I watched the Challenger disaster live on television, um, where every single NASA astronaut blew up in the air um, live while I was drawing a picture in front of the television set. And I have these two images here as a sort of juxtaposition between the generations. Um, if we think about 1969 at, with the moon landing, uh, that would provide a very different sort of alternative worldview, one that was really steeped in optimism versus mine, which might have really sort of promoted a, a culture of anxiety versus opp opportunity. I was raised by the television set for the most part. Um, my mom used to refer to me as the walking jingle machine as I knew every single one of them, especially upon our return when we had American television. Um, I was raised during the Reagan administration where conversations about family values really did dominate um, and greed really persisted in, in a sort of application as we think about um, what was happening economically. I was raised just outside of Chicago it was incredibly diverse. I went to one of the largest high schools in the country um, and also one of the most dangerous. Here's a little bit about a little image of my studio here, um, sort of how I work. It's a very, very clean practice. I've had a lot of studios in my career. Um, my ideal day is working in a clean space with all the creature comforts, something streaming, a dog underfoot, uh, coffee, and great lighting. I grew up during the AIDS crisis, um, and during that crisis, it was indeed a death sentence. Um, coming of age as a queer person uh, and being con conditioned to believe that my identity was shameful uh, was really perpetuated by the media uh, and by politics. And it really did affect the way I viewed um, courtship and love as I grew up. Um, one of my earlier memories is actually seeing this image um, completed by a collective group called Grand Fury. They were an activist art collective and they used sort of a guerrilla dissemination tactic in order to communicate the urgency of the AIDS epidemic. Um, and in the age of a very disastrous government response or lack of response and political inaction, um, this graphic was created as a reaction uh, to a 1986 New York Times editorial um, by a super conservative who proposed that all persons with AIDS should be tattooed in the upper forearm to protect common needle users and on the buttocks to prevent and protect the victimization of other homosexuals. 
So this was made as a response to that. In 2014, I spent a whole semester with 20 students in the south of Spain at the base of the Sierra Nevadas. This was the last stronghold where the Islamic Caliphate was pushed out of Europe, the Moors, in 1492 uh, by Ferdinand and Isabella. Yes, the Ferdinand and Isabella. Uh, the effects on the architecture and the landscape are still really, really evident, and they started to inch towards my work as a sort of maximalist examination of decadence. And I spent a lot of time looking up at holy ceilings, whether it be mosques, um, whether it be um, the Catholic Church. It really did sort of speak to um, faith, um, the body, sensuality, um, and the neo-baroque started to play a, a role in uh, the decisions I made in my work. It, it was around this time I was introduced to the work of a guy named Grinling Gibbons. Um, he ha he's sort of the preeminent um, court wood sculptor um, for Hampton Court, where Henry VIII had his, uh, basically, his station. Um, much of my work is a direct reaction to art history um, through a kind of relensing that allows for a reconsideration of the values that are reflective um, in a contemporary audience. Um, I really like the quote from Winston Churchill, the longer you look back, the farther you can look forward. So these works in this entire body of work was prepared using a kind of digital planning, uh, making a, a, a kind of pastiche. I, I make these in Photoshop, typically uh, from a visual archive using my own images and then found images, and then I remix them into a play of dichotomies often. Um, I'm really interested in obscuring and revealing, attraction and repulsion, good and evil, the past and the present. So the work became about sensuality. I would pair Hellenistic sculpture with seductive or tactile surfaces that were meant to either seduce or repulse or both. I'm really interested in the interaction of parts um, and to the tactile in an increasingly technological and dehumanized time. So it's through appropriation or the borrowing of images that really pull from both high and low culture that I really do seek to kind of uphold the painting process while dismantling the kind of elitist presumptions that we have and that they're associated with. Uh, I oftentimes make these images as a way to meditate on issues of gender, on identity construction and beauty. Um, though they're conceived initially of in a kind of digital process that is con I consider to be sort of like my sketchbook, digital sketchbook, they're made employing a really purist approach to watercolor. I'm heavily influenced by surrealism as much as I don't want to be. Um, they oftentimes depict the unnerving, illogical scenes in order to allow the unconscious mind to express itself. Um, this image is taken from uh, Bernini, uh, the, ex the Ecstasy of St. Teresa, um, and then really sort of begs the question, is she in climax or is she in pain? Um, this particular image is St. Sebastian, who's known as the sort of unofficial patron saint of gays and lesbians. And I'm really interested in picture puzzles. Uh, I'm not terribly in love with M.C. Escher, but I do see his work playing a major role in the, in the formal decisions that I make, especially in this body of work, um, which really does draw on uh, this sort of pairing of 21st century imagery um, and the body as it relates to Hellenistic sculpture. Um, the glitch playing a major role um, in how I choose to do that. I realized in undergrad that I was a postmodernist. Um, and what is postmodernism? Well, in short, it really is a reappraisal of modernist assumptions, um, especially as it relates to class, race, gender, etc. cetera. Um, it takes on the appropriation and questions the ownership of images. Um, so I'm an appropriationist. It really does seek to examine one's relationship to, the, to globalization uh, versus your identity as an individual. Um, it oftentimes uses satire or irony as a way to provoke change and communicate uh, difficult messages. And it sees popular culture as a really valid representation of culture. It doesn't have a, 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 a sort of elitist view about what is high and low brow. So the next body of work that I want to talk about really did pull from um, the history of watercolor, but also the history of naturalist um, illustration, specifically the works of John James Audubon. 
Um, John James Audubon, of course, famous uh, and somewhat troubling and problematic today, um, he killed about 100 birds daily for the project of the encyclopedic um, illustr illustration project of um, depicting every single bird in both North and South America. Um, the cost of printing the entire work was about $115,000, which is over about $2 million today. And he paid for that using subscriptions that he actually sold door to door. Um, yeah, and he really did kind of complete a remarkable accomplishment here. It took him about 14 years um, of doing field observations and drawings. And he single-handedly managed this. Um, and of course, his relationship to watercolor is the source of the prints. Um, I'm also interested in the work of Maria Sibylla Marion, who was a 17th century naturalist illustrator. She was a German entomologist. She was a naturalist. She was a, she was a scientific illustrator as well. Um, and she was a bit of a feminist rogue in that she traveled on her own with her daughter to the depths of uh, the jungle in Dutch Suriname, uh, which is basically uh, Dutch Guyana today uh, in South America, in order to observe insects in the wild. And I really seek to ask the question if we had, you know, cabinets of curiosities today in the 21st century, what would we pull out and what would we share? So the next body of work really did seek to sort of like investigate the tradition of um, scientific illustration, but also um, investigate the sort of aesthetic language of it. Um, in 2020, I was given a grant to go to the National, uh, by the National Museum of Women in the Arts in order to go and develop a whole visual archive of the back rooms of the Smithsonian's Museum of Natural History in order to pull those images into my work. And so the breadth of my work really started to um, really expand from there. Um, so ultimately, I started to appropriate images from Audubon in his background usage uh, or his background depictions, and I would pull in um, sort of alternative, very, very tactile, very, very sensual surfaces into the negative shape of the birds or the depictions themselves. I didn't only pull from him, I pulled from a whole array of artists. Uh, specifically one of them being Andreas Vesalis. Um, he's often referred to as the founder of modern human anatomy. He was Flemish. Uh, it, it was 16th century. Um, he was a physician as well, and he was the author of one of the most important and influential books on human anatomy. Why? Because it was an enormous evolution from the well-known Galen, who for about four or five hundred years was pretty much the preeminent uh, voice of human anatomy. Um, and it was, for the most part, very, very incorrect. Um, so in 1539, um, a judge in a Padua, Italy criminal court was really interested in Basilius's work, and he had agreed to regularly supply him with cadavers of executed criminals because it was illegal to dissect uh, people. Um, and there are accounts that some of those uh, were performed on live subjects, sadly. So I definitely pulled him into my work as well. I was really interested in the sort of poster image of entomology as well. Um, these take a long, long time. They're highly and richly colored. Um, and I really wanted to make a really sort of beautiful facsimile of the aesthetic of these naturalist history images while really seeking to invest the sensual, the tactile, the beautiful, through the nuances of um, the modern world around us. Uh, this is a, a sort of concurrent body of work along the same time um, that ultimately are, are called butterfly kisses, which focus on the mouth, um, and then the source images are directly uh, pulling from my friends and loved ones. So here's a little install with that. So many of these were just simply playing around with the collage element on Photoshop as a means to really investigate um, surface. I was also thinking about the work of Ernst Haeckel. Um, he was a German zoologist, a naturalist, a philosopher. He was a professor and 
you know, a marine biologist and also an artist. He discovered and described and named thousands of new species. Um, he ma mapped a genealogical tree relating to all life forms and coined many terms in biology, including ecology, phylum. Um, he did a great book called Art Forms of Nature, which would actually go on to influence Art Nouveau as an artistic movement. Um, problematically, but not surprisingly, Haeckel was also a promoter of scientific racism, and he embraced the idea of social Darwinism, making him a notorious eugenicist. So I'm interested in visual puns, which is a sort of play on images that can have multiple meanings. So the mouth being an all-important orifice, one that is simply a vessel, but it also can be the source of much pain and much pleasure. Uh, here's an installation shot of some of these paintings. Uh, the next body of work that I'll talk about is called Flash Cocotte. Um, it's a sort of ongoing body of work. It, what does Flash Cocotte mean? It's a type of French uh, happening. It's a, a, a queer pop-up party that's announced only the day of in closed social media circuits. And it's done that way in order to kind of, kind of allow for a safe space. Um, so touching on spaces that are inherently queer that, or that I've made queer, I've altered found images in order to focus on movement, time, and micro-expressions. The micro-expressions in which the way the body might move in order to kind of code source, um, to suggest to the population around that there might be a sort of queer element in the body that it is inhabiting. And motion can be a record of time, but it can also be one of glee. Um, it's incredibly jarring, it's very active. Um, so an image about slowness can actually be reflective of time when played with to multiply elements and bodies, to push them towards a surrealist um, visual affectation, but for the most part um, become queered. So I'm upholding Hellenistic standards of beauty, which of course are you know in question today, but I really do want to really sort of inquire about the conformity in queer culture. Uh, what is objectification and what is autoeroticism? Do I want to be her? Do I want to be with her? Uh, this is actually an image of Pat, Pat uh, Benatar, who is my very first concert. So what are queer spaces? Um, writer Neetha Joseph, uh, she says, quote, often described elegantly as the architecture of desire, a queer space can be simply put as a space or strategy that intrinsically connects or ties in architecture with a person's identity or sexual identity. Queer, person, queer spaces are designed for one's body to be, defining the need to iterate one's true identity, sexuality, and need to connect, be it sexually or communally. So here's a little bit about my process. Um, I'm a very traditional watercolorist. I painstakingly draw these out in graphite, um, and then I isolate and hold on to and uh, avoid all of the light so as to create a fully luminous um, and layered painting. I do the same thing when I'm working in ink wash. It's the exact same approach, except ink wash is, of course, not resoluble. Um, this is a body of work, uh, a concurrent body of work called the Three Dollar Icons. It's a play on the phrase that I oftentimes heard growing up, he's as queer as a $3 bill. So it's a play on that and sort of reclaiming that. Um, I started to impose very, very minimal interventions on well-known celebrity gay icons as a way to create kind of a disrupted or monstrous portrait. So I really seek to question what happens to portraiture when we integrate ourselves in a way that disrupts the function. So it's there that I'll end, um, and I'd like for you all to go to the Google Classroom as a means to uh, really read up on what your expectations are for your talk. Thank you so much.